All right, everyone. I am here with Dylan Erb. Dylan is the co-founder and CEO of Paperspace. Dylan, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Awesome. Excited to be here. It's great to have you on the show. I was thinking back to when we first met and you introduced me to this great coffee shop across the the street, I guess, or around the corner from your old offices in Brooklyn. Uh, looks like you've got a new space now where you've got lots of cool plants. Yep. Still in Brooklyn, just down the street. But uh, yeah, I guess uh, it's been a while. Glad to be here. Awesome. So uh, we are going to be focusing in on uh, the general topic of machine learning as a software engineering discipline, uh, touching on ideas like MLOps and CICD and what all that means for folks that are trying to get ML into production. But before we do that, uh, let's start with a little bit of your background and how you came to, you know, found a company that is you know, in the center of helping folks, you know, work on you know, machine learning problems. Yeah. Uh, so uh, time flies, but we've actually been at this for about five years now. Um, my background, and this will kind of inform some of the probably the conversation today, but um, my background is a little bit non-traditional. I uh, studied building architecture and kind of on the architecture engineering side. Um, and what used to be probably more in like the HPC world. So working more with like uh, genetic algorithms, and I was doing things around topology optimization. Uh, that led to an interest in parallel compute, and GPUs were really the name of the game and have continued to be so. Um, and so I started Paperspace with my uh, co-founder and, and good buddy, Dan, uh, Dan Cobran. And uh, yeah, so we, you know, our general premise, and it's definitely evolved, was that, um, you know, GPUs as sort of a uh, kind of parallel compute device would make its way into the cloud and there would be all sorts of, you know, new applications that would emerge from that. And um, I think what we, you know, weren't aware of at the time was that the big driver of that was going to be this, you know, shift from like visual compute into just, you know, massive data processing and, and the emergence of like deep learning as kind of a, a practical discipline as well. Um, so, yeah, that's how I got into it. And, and now I uh, uh, primarily just think about that, which is sort of uh, how do these, you know, new tools evolve and, and support kind of emerging workflows, tools, products, things like that. Yeah, I think you and uh, NVIDIA maybe have that in common. You know, we're going after a totally different use case for GPUs, uh, one that was graphics focused and were quick to recognize the, the activity or the, the shift that was happening around ML and AI. Uh, what were what were some of the first use cases that you you saw that kind of clued you into interesting activity in this space? Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it, when you're an early stage company, you kind of you know I was manning support as well as doing everything else at the company, and so you email everyone who signs up, um, and you're just like, hey, what are you up to? Uh, and we started, you know, this was new to me, but we started getting more requests for people saying, hey, I, I'm trying this thing out called TensorFlow. Uh, you guys have GPUs. This was before really the big cloud providers had offered GPUs as just like a, uh, you know, a native compute device. Um, obviously today they're, they're pervasive. Um, and so we were like, tell us more, you know, what are you building? And so that's kind of been the format of the conversation for, you know, uh, the last four years. And so, you know, in that time we've seen, well, actually two things, interestingly, one, you know, the emergence of like this deep learning practice where you need a lot of compute. So you need a lot of things. You need data, you need compute, you need expertise, but compute is a big part of it. You know, you can, you know, you, you're, you're not going to make a driverless car algorithm on a Chromebook. So there is a compute requirement. Um, and then kind of the interesting thing is even today, and I'm sure this is, you know, bumped up in, in your universe as well, which is sort of the, uh, the, the blending of the visual compute, um, kind of side of things or everything from like image generation, deep fakes being sort of the big, uh, example, or now we're seeing things like synthetic data. So the compute pipeline and the visualization pipeline, I think, are collapsing in a really interesting way, um, where you know visual effects are, are are you know just as interested in in deep learning uh, as like a you know thing in their tool belt. So so it is a it's been a weird few years where uh, you know the first pitch deck I remember the first slide was what's a GPU, uh, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> luckily we don't we don't have to bring that one up anymore. People kind of get it. Nice, nice, nice. And uh, Paperspace has been popular in uh, our community for quite a while. We do a bunch of study groups around courses like Fast AI and others. And 
you know, for years now, folks, uh, in trying to do those courses, you, you look for infrastructure in which to run it on and paper space has always been one of those options. Uh, but the company is doing more now than just, you know, a, a, a server instance with the GPU We're kind of going up the stack. Can you talk a little bit about about that and the motivation there? Yeah, definitely. So uh, paper space is the name of the company and our kind of main product or kind of collection of products is called Gradient. Um, and that encompasses uh, really a handful of components around what, you know, we'd probably call an ML ops platform. And, you know, we definitely should dive into to what exactly that comprises. Um, but yeah, today we, you know, provide tools for pretty much every step of the uh, kind of building the machine learning model process. Um, but really with an emphasis, uh, again, coming from our kind of background in uh, the infrastructure side of things, like a focus on where the uh, kind of machine learning world intersects with the you know, infrastructure or networking issues, or more broadly, just how does it interface with you know, traditional software development and application development that you know, has also been changing quite quickly, but has you know, become a relatively established pattern for you know, all sorts of companies to build on top of. Yeah, and, and as you mentioned, this has been a, a, a quickly evolving space in terms of the, you know, your perspective on, you know, slash take slash interest in the the ML ops and infrastructure side, or you know, to what degree are are you, I guess, productizing or or you know, drawing learnings from the experiences that you had. You know, standing up these you know these uh, data centers with with GPUs versus um, you know stuff that you're seeing evolve elsewhere outside of the company. Like what what's kind of the core um, the, the core around which you're you know building out a, a, a an approach to ML ops. Yeah, so I think there's kind of two levels of it. The the first level is just like you know what does the thing do? Um, and to date, you know, uh, we offer. Um, you know, one click sign up any developer and one of the most popular ways of onboarding is you know through a, a course like fast ai um which we'll be you know partnering with on the next version as well um it's sort of the entry point and the question is you know how can you kind of get right into the meat of the problem start looking at some pytorch or tensorflow or you know try out gpt2 or something like that without even thinking about infrastructure um so there you know there's kind of the practical piece of that um of just onboarding to it and um and then on top of that the question is you know, what are, I think across the industry, there's this, um, a lot of interest in creating purpose built tools for machine learning, because we can all agree or people that, you know, spend some time with it will say, will acknowledge that, you know, it does have some fundamental differences from traditional software development. You know, um, we can talk about the programming languages. Some folks are coming from R or their backgrounds in stats or, or math. Um, uh, the, the hardware itself, obviously, you know, GPUs are not required for building out a web app. Um, and in, in, within machine learning, there's obviously a whole host of types of machines. So there's, there is a particular um, uh, need to think about the hardware as a primitive in your system. So, you know, um, so when you zoom out kind of collectively, I think the bigger problem and the way we talk about, you know, the way we uh, evangelize it is to say, um, we believe machine learning is a part of a traditional software engineering practice. And the good thing about that is when you start uh, diving into something like an ML ops platform, you you have a lot to draw on, which is you know a whole you know, ten years of uh, at least of um, you know modern software development practices. So that encompasses things like continuous integration, continuous deployment, um, obviously tight integrations with source control management, and in the case of machine learning, you know data management um, and and provenance, um, and and you start thinking about it in a different way. So. Um, the, the benefit of a traditional software development practice that might be like agile or um, you know based around CI CD is that you can you know we're a, we're a, so, a, a software company that builds a web application a web console a lot of tools um, and we can you know bring new people into that collaborative effort and they can work in sort of guidelines that means that they can very quickly start um, you know shipping production code so machine learning is newer in the sense that you know, not every company is in the, like, we need to ship this into production. But if you look at the process of like testing some assumptions, building a little model out, and then trying to get into production, the uh, the kind of um, the framework that you need to think about it in uh, is just like any other software, you know, development paradigm. Um, and we feel strongly that, you know, this, the, the closest analogy is probably something like mobile app development, where, 
uh, you know, historically it was like you have your iOS team when the iPhone came out and you have your, you know, regular software team or your website team. And eventually those two merged and the, the, the baseline practices are the same. And we, we think that's the, you know, the case for machine learning as well. We're just at the beginning of that curve. Now, a lot of folks uh, push back on that and, and say that there are fundamental differences in the way that machine learning and, and data science more broadly should be practiced. Uh, yep. And it's not, um, you know, it, it's not as predictable that as software engineering, um, you know, what's your, you know, how do you respond to that kind of, do you, well, first of all, do you even encounter that? Like the, the, do you yeah. that kind of pushback and what's your, what's your take on that? Well, I, I think it's a, an emerging discipline um, that has, that has moved quite quickly. And it's also happened at the same time that we've, you know, it's, it's happening at the same time that we're also seeing pretty large, large shifts in how software is developed. And I think the, mm -hmm. you know, the biggest trends here we can talk about are, you know, containerization, the idea that you can have kind of reproducibility at the, at the, uh, as like a primitive in your pipeline, um, the emergence of these kind of more complex tools like Kubernetes, which is still, you know, a, a, a complex, um, uh, thing to set up and to manage, and you have companies that are seeing the benefits of this. Um, but fundamentally, we're starting to, uh, you know, software development is shifting, and that's happening right as machine learning is trying to figure out sort of what its relationship is. So I think there is a lot to that, and I think it, it in the sense that there are people that would argue um, that maybe the foundational part of machine learning is more exploratory; it doesn't quite have you know one-to-one -one mappings into um, you know software development. Um, but I, I don't think that is um, true across the board. And by that, I mean, you know, there are a lot of really useful analogies we can draw from. Um, you know, we, we think a lot about, uh, you know, if you think of Git or GitHub as sort of a, the standard in, in collaboration on software projects today, um, there's some fundamental, act, you know, um, things you can do. You know, you can fork, you can, you have pull requests, you have branches. Um, they don't map perfectly to the machine learning model. You know, your iteration, could be very quick on a, on a machine learning model, or it could be really slow if it takes a long time to train. But in either case, there are useful um, things to draw on, you know, uh, de development, staging and production environments, you know, being able to promote things. Uh, and that's, that's a traditional software engineering practice, largely. So the question is, how do they interface? And that's what we, you know, spend a lot of time uh, on Gradient trying to tease out where, where you can get the best of both worlds. Like, where can you draw on those um, kind of best practices and, and where does it diverge? Like the reality is if, if it were just a software development practice, you could use, you know, Jenkins or, you know, a, a traditional kind of CI CD pipeline runner uh, for machine learning. And, and you really can't do that. There are, you know, the artifacts are different. The machine learning model is a very important artifact at the center of this. Data is a, is a you know, as important as code, as a primitive, as an input to the pipeline. So yeah, let's uh, maybe dig into that a little bit uh, yeah. in, in a little bit more detail. I, I uh, I'm imagining that folks that are coming at things from the more traditional data science uh, perspective don't really have any idea what a Jenkins is uh, or CI/CD pipeline. Yep. Um, you know, maybe talk through, you know, kind of your take on that traditional world from a, a software engineering perspective, and then you know we can talk through like how it maps to, um, you know, the way you see the ML ops world. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I think at, a, at the foundational level, the idea is um, you you commit to, uh, you know, you certain things get committed into your development process, even, you know, literally as part of like a, a config file that goes into your repo or um, something that says, like, here are the steps of the process, meaning, um, you know, we transform some data, we send it to uh, this machine type with this, um, you know, container and this uh, framework, TensorFlow 2.1 or whatever. Um, and this has an artifact that we then deploy. So there's a kind of a pipeline. And so the foundation of CI CD, and there are a lot of you know, components to it, is that if you can make those more reproducible and deterministic, then, then ultimately as a software developer or an organization trying to you know, build a, uh, an impactful machine learning model, that you can do that more quickly and you know, more safely because you can sort of see what every step of the process was. Um, so you know, when you talk about machine learning, folks talk about machine learning as sort of a black box, like you put in data and you get out some predictive model that's like hard to um, interrogate. I think part of it is that this is really uh, powerful, uh, powerful algorithms that are still hard to fully understand. But the other part of it is um, the normal way of developing them, at least, you know, we work with everyone from, uh, you know, university students to, uh, you know, um, organizations like 
that are very much coming at it from like a business intelligence perspective. And in both cases, you know, because it's a new practice, there aren't there aren't uh, patterns fully established yet. So people are frantically looking for the, the you know the the tool stack to make it happen. Um, and I think that ML ops has kind of done itself a bit of a disservice in that it presents itself as such a totalizing thing, which is really not if you're thinking about it from a software development perspective. It's not the um, that, that's really there there aren't good parallels for that. Like in in traditional software development, or if we're making our web application today, or your iOS app, or whatever, you're using thirty different tools. But you're doing it and you're structuring it in a way that is, um, you know, we're all in agreement on it. It, it. You know, you 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 commit sort of the important parts of the pipeline. You add tests, you add checks so that someone can come in. They can, you know, everything is tied to source control. So, um, you know, you can you can experiment in a branch and then come back in. Uh, and I think a lot of those are really useful for thinking about, you know, machine learning. Not all, not, you know, in its entirety, but certainly a lot of the components that people struggle with today and, and taking this from R&D into production, which is really the name of the game. Uh, you know, I think when my my guess is that folks who know paper space and and gradient in particular from a user perspective think of it as you know primarily what the interface that it's providing, kind of a notebook like experience, and uh, you know maybe notebooks as a service we could call it. And uh, when you think of ML ops platform, you know, you think of all this enterprise stuff, containers and Kubernetes and uh, things like that. How do, how do you get from one to, to the next? Is all that stuff just the stuff that you're using to allow folks to spin up these notebooks or what's the relationship? Yeah, so so uh, we call it kind of like the gradient notebook lab, which is, um, you know, the wrapper around Jupyter. Um, you can actually use other uh, kind of IDE like environments, but Jupyter has certainly uh, become the de facto standard. That's that's really only one part of gradient, um, but it's all built on the same foundation. And that foundation is um, committed to the idea of reproducibility, adding UUIDs to every step of the process. So even if someone comes in and, and the most popular uh, kind of product we have is, is certainly notebooks. Anyone can come in. We have a, 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 a tool called the ML Showcase where they can one click, run it on a free instance in the cloud and, and kind of, you know, get their feet wet with the with the uh, machine learning tooling. Um, and, and that's important because our general view is that for every thousand software developers, you, you have maybe one who's a machine learning expert. So the question is, how do you onboard the machine learning technology for everyone else? And they're going to they have to try it out. So notebooks are certainly one part of it. Um, but as folks kind of get more advanced within Gradient, um, we, we offer a lot of like kind of uh, ways of making the, the pipeline sort of building on top of it. So the notebook is, is always running in a container. When you shut it down, we, we, we do a Docker commit to make sure that you have sort of the, the reproducibility and the history. Um, and then you can go a step further and then connect that to a GitHub repo. Uh, you can actually, uh, we have like a, a job runner architecture, very similar to how kind of the paradigm has been established where you can use a CLI or a Python SDK and then just send a task and have it, you know, get scheduled across a, a you know, a single node or a, a large scale distributed set of nodes. Um, and then tools like uh, we have one called Gradient CI, which is just a GitHub bot or uh, application where, uh, you know, we give you rich pull request information back. So, um, you know, notebooks are the entry point, but they're not exclusive uh, or they're certainly not the end of it. It's really the question of are you where are you on the kind of data processing or development uh, machine learning development life cycle? Mm -hmm. uh as you've built this out, where where are the areas that you know what areas presented the the most challenges and and you know we can kind of uh, you know take this from different levels. One thing that I'm thinking about, as you mentioned, like you're transparently committing stuff to to get. Like, are you are you doing that? Um, you know, whenever I close out of a notebook, or every time I you know run a new cell, or like, how do you yeah, that's a good. connection between you know challenges and that question is like you know there's all this questions about granularity and I imagine that you know you've had to figure out a lot of that stuff along the way. Yeah, so I would say to to that particular one, I think that is still unresolved in the sense that um, <laughs> I don't think there's the best version of it that will exist in a year or two that that exists today, and I think it's been a lot of back and forth. Um, you know, you know, Jupyter notebooks are. Uh, formatted JSON objects with sort of a, a special cell type and everything else. And they don't really map super well to the code that's actually running in it, at least from yep. like a, a code diffing or source control management perspective. And you've uh, got so folks like uh, Interact coming out of Netflix that are trying to, um, 
you know, do interesting things with notebooks to make them more runnable. You have folks that are yeah. trying to take notebooks and turn them into executable objects. There's this whole ecosystem of innovation happening around the notebook ex itself, not to mention stuff that Jupyter is doing. So it's a bit yeah. of a moving target from that perspective. Totally. And from our perspective, it's just a container. And I think that's the okay. important part. Um, you know, we actually uh, big fans of Interact. I think that's a, a really important step in the, you know, basically they're created, they've created a, a, a TypeScript and JavaScript, like React library, a web, a web framework kind of interface for Jupyter. Um, and I think that's doing a lot to move this as, you know, another kind of traditional primitive that can be used in the web stack. Um, but from our perspective, it's a it's a container that has to be scheduled on a on a node somewhere. And even in, within that kind of um, uh, part of the process, there's a lot of complexity. You know, there there are a million types of instances you can run on. There are a million ways of um, uh, you know setting up how you do storage and artifact management and things like that. And our perspective is, um, you know, you should there there are sort of like best practices of like, hey, we can you know. One example here, we um, within Gradient, we, there are um, experiments that you can run, which are just you, you give us a container and some code and we're going to execute that, uh, as well as notebooks. And both of them, at the, you know, at the fundamental level uh, of Gradient, which is actually built, built on top of Kubernetes, um, is that we're thinking about these as containers with a lot of nice kind of um, uh, glue in between. So, uh, for example, providing a single persistent uh, high performance directory that's available across notebooks, uh, experiments and ultimately your deployments as well. Um, and so thinking about it as like an infrastructural problem where you want to, um, you know, deploy a model, be able to see what, you know, what experiment created it, um, who, what line of code generated that, and then also use the feedback from that, you know, in the, the kind of holy grail here, which is to create a kind of continuous uh, life cycle. Um, and, you know, I think that's also an unsolved problem, but the way to solve it is, in, you know, I strongly believe is one that is looks more like a traditional software, you know, engineering stack issue. Um, and so, you know, we, we, you've seen a lot of like, a lot of the dialogue in the in this ecosystem is around like build versus buy, or, you know, what's the one true platform? Is it this, you know, is it SageMaker or Kubeflow or, or Gradient? I think that the 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 way this will resolve itself is that it'll be just like everything, everything else. Your every software team will build certain components, buy certain components, and mix and match them in a way that looks probably a lot like how, you know, software gets developed today. You know, uh, when we send our website out, we have like every release, we ha we use tools like, you know, code coverage, uh, regression testing libraries, visual testing libraries. Um, you know, we use Circle CI for our, our CI CD engine. We use a lot of Argo. It, w there's a, a whole host of tools. And within this organization, we have our own practices. Like, you know, we've defined among the engineers here, um, myself definitely less now, but, uh, you know, how the... Uh, um, you know, what's the, wh how, when do you make a branch? When do you make a pull request? When is it okay to make a release on something? So a lot of that, you still have to build a lot of your own methodology around software development. That's what makes a, you know, an organization effective. Um, but the tooling itself, you know, you will need purpose-built tools. And we're, we're kind of making the case that we're offering a, a version of this that we think is, you know, uh, built to, you know, grow into the next iteration where, you know, machine learning becomes more prolific, not as, you know, as a domain, but as just a software engineering practice, kind of more fundamentally. Do you think that the at a given organization, the tooling is best provided by folks that are familiar with the the so existing software engineering, uh, you know, practices, or you know, folks that are more coming at it from the the data science side, and and um, you know, curious your what you've seen in that regard. Yeah, uh, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll add to the controversy. I, I do think this is something that, you know, at least at the very least has to um, engage the kind of sysops, devops person or, or, the, or the team that's responsible for shipping production grade code, you know, whatever that looks like. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's the domain of the data scientist or machine learning engineer necessarily, um, but I also think that the interface needs to be better defined, meaning, you know, uh, we have to find a way that people can easily integrate with um, uh, uh, source control management and, you know, the, the primitive artifact that gets deployed. Like, for example, you know, you've heard stories, I'm sure, of, you know, uh, a model gets developed and then it gets rewritten in Java by somebody else so that they can actually deploy it in their system. I think the Kubernetes, you know, containerized future and the, the world we're living in presents a nice uh, kind of 
in-between model, which is that if you can containerize this thing and sort of define its inputs and outputs, then the artifact that comes out is something that you can hand off to the to the DevOps team and they can they can deploy effectively. You know, and they can deploy tools like you know Prometheus or you know metrics and logging and things that really are not within the the scope of the um, the machine learning kind of domain. And I think that's it's the separation of concerns that I think isn't really well defined. And so the out the outcome of that is that really sophisticated companies, you know, Facebook, Spotify, et cetera, you know, they have to build their own tools because they they need to push this discipline forward. Um, that's not going to be the case for most companies in the world. And then the question is sort of what does that tool stack look like? You know, and ours is a proposal that is um, very much designed for you know a company that wants to produce production grade software and how machine learning integrates in, inside, you know, into that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting example you gave. Uh, like everything or like many things in tech, maybe it's, yeah, there's a bit of a pendulum going back and forth. Uh, when I first started tracking this space eight something years ago or more, um, a lot of the early folks, a lot of the early goals and messaging of these early tool vendors, most of which are not still around was, you know, your data scientists are developing software or developing models in R and SaaS and things like that. And you have no way to put them into production. And so you have to hand them over to folks that are, you know, like you said, building them in Java or building them in C, C++, whatever. Um, and the, you know, the whole idea of a lot of these early tools was that you can, you know, develop and deploy in Python, right? And uh, a lot of the argument was that you wouldn't have to pull in a separate person. The data scientist could just do that. Uh, and then the the next wave of that was, well, you know, eh, maybe that's not going to work. We've got our data scientists. Let's hire a bunch of machine learning engineers, and you know, they'll be part of this process. And as opposed to kind of letting the tooling handle. Uh, the productionalization, we've got people that come from more of a software engineering background. Um, and it sounds like you're talking about a further evolution of this uh, pendulum, which is, well, containers will just do it for us. Yeah, I mean, I think that, <laughs> I, I don't know how much I'll commit to that particular version. Uh, I, I'll agree it's a pendulum. I, I do think that, um, you know, like I've said, I think this is a software engineering practice, or at least there are a lot of, you know, pieces we can pull from that. Yeah. Um, I do think it's made leaps and bounds forward on in the sense that, you know, containers are really, really helpful for, you know, building out web applications. They're portable, they're reproducible, you know, my dev environment is similar to yours. It's, you, you can't map that perfectly to, um, uh, you know, the machine learning development process, but there's, there's also, you know, newer concepts, like there's uh, in the Kubernetes world, there's a lot of talk about, you know, solving the inner loop of development, which is um, basically saying, you know, we, we have the, as a software, software engineering problem, we have these complicated systems, you know, uh, paper space and gradient is a whole lot of services, a bunch of microservices, a bunch of big services. Um, how do, how do you, uh, basically keep a fidelity between your production environment and your development environment in the, you know, because maybe your laptop isn't going to run the whole host of production environments. So, you know, a lot of interest in, or a lot of software development from coming a lot from Google, we have got tools like scaffold. And the idea here is that, you know, you want to, uh, they call it the inner loop of development, which is like before it goes into production, someone's just iterating on it, which I think actually is what a lot of the data scientists who push back on the machine learning or the ML ops kind of paradigm that is totalizing is, you know, uh, they're like, oh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna work in a notebook here locally, and I just, you know, I don't think every line of code here needs to be committed to source control, and that's and that's true. You know, you don't need to you don't need to get you know heavy handed with it, um, but it is an open problem and open discussion in even the Kubernetes world, way you know uh, totally distinct from the machine learning world. Um, and I you know I think that the conversations are most productive when the two you know engage in that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I like. People that are interested in the kind of deriving insight from a machine learning model, uh, you know, they want to be working in these amazing tools like TensorFlow and PyTorch. But at the same time, if you look at like PyTorch's evolution um, as like a, another kind of uh, proxy of this, you know, um, they have native C++ bindings. And there's a lot of there's a lot of um, uh, push to make this a regular software development thing because Python has all sorts of limitations. It's a, it's a very expressive language, um, very powerful in machine learning. Uh, but isn't maybe the best one for, you know, uh, squeezing out the performance from your incredibly expensive cloud GPU resources or something like that. 
Um, so I think it's coming from both dimensions. You know, you've got like the software engineers trying to do more machine learning stuff. You got the ML folks that are like, yeah, we want to, you know, become more uh, kind of pervasive in an organization or, or have higher impact in what gets shipped. Um, and it's an evolving practice. But I, I do think that, you know, uh, I, I, or sorry, I would say I don't believe that there's one ML ops platform to rule them all. And it has to do the best training, you know, uh, model aggregation, quantizing and, uh, you know, uh, A-B testing and like the full end to end. But I do think that there's a lot of value in tools you know, like Kubeflow, which I would say is probably the closest analogy to, to Gradient, um, where you know, you're setting up something that's kind of foundational. And there's, you know, in the case of Kubeflow, I think there's a lot of setup that's required. It is a complicated tool stack. And in, in the case of Gradient, it's kind of like, you know, we're going to manage it for you a bit more. Um, but yeah, I think that in, enlisting the you know, DevOps systems people who have to manage this thing and keep it running, early on in the process sets you up for success and allows you to ultimately get all the things we always talk about, you know, more models, faster, you know, higher impact, all that kind of stuff. Right. Right. And is there a relationship between gradient and, and cube flow is gradient, you know, does gradient use parts of cube flow or is, uh, should we think of gradient as a paper space analogy to cube flow, but one that, you know, has features that are specific to the way you view the world. Yeah. Um, so it's an interesting question. I think it's evolving as well. I think Kubeflow is a really interesting project. It's still relatively early. And I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, Kubernetes is also something that, you know, not a lot of organizations have expertise in yet. So it is something that is a little bit harder to get going, but very powerful. Um, where we overlap is we are also based on Kubernetes. I mean, Kubernetes is just container orchestration, some networking stuff, and some nice best practices. I know I'm trivializing Kubernetes, but uh, it doesn't do anything really around machine learning um, or auto scaling is in particular to GPUs and things like that. Kubeflow does a lot in, in that way, but the, the best part of, of Kubeflow, um, at least what we've seen work really well, are uh, is, is, it's, is the fact that it's based on top of Argo as the um, kind of pipeline tool, so Argo CD. Um, so we also use Argo. Uh, the difference is, you know, Kubeflow uh, compiles down to Argo YAML ultimately. Um, we have our own syntax that also compiles down. Uh, and so the newest iteration of this is that they are compatible at a kind of fundamental level, but, um, you know, we bias certain things. Um, we also, I mean, the most important differentiator between those two projects is that we have a um, very sophisticated, like, GUI console where you can do most things through, you know, again, because most data science, you know, data science and kind of statisticians and, and mathematicians are not the same people that um, can, can string up very complex, uh, you know, Kubernetes tooling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for those that don't know, Argo is the underlying workflow engine. How is that workflow engine used in uh, Gradient or uh, Kubeflow for that matter? Yeah. So the, I mean, the, 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 the kind of underlying piece is this uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment uh, engine, which basically says, you know, um, here are the steps in the process. Like this thing happens, then this thing happens. Uh, I need to build a container. I need to pull my data in. I need to process that data. And each thing is sort of a step in that process. Um, and then you start thinking about like what the triggers to that. So this is another area where the, the kind of CI CD paradigm doesn't map fully between machine learning and you know web app development or containerized you know um, Node.js apps, which is uh, the the types of triggers can be very different. Like normally the trigger in a, in a, in a uh, when you make a web app or an iOS app is you, you push new code, you have a code commit exactly. and that, and, and that yeah. causes, you know, that's the primary trigger. Um, in the case of machine learning, there are some interesting ones that I think still, you know, early, you know, early days, but um, you know, there are concepts like model drift and data drift. Um, you know, we joke around, it's like, you know, code is just, or a code commit is just code drift. It's just like something has changed. So let's, let's kick off this pipeline again. And Argo is a really nice one, which gives you, it's a Kubernetes native CI CD engine, and there are a bunch of components to it. And, and that is the, um, a big part of, of Kubeflow. Um, and we also use that as, as, uh, as sort of our underlying engine. Um, but on top of that, there are a lot of other things with just like the UI, how you expose it, the command line interface, the, the way you expose the syntax and semantics. And I think it's a race you talked earlier about the, um, you know, the right level of granularity. And I think that is the, the big question. And I think that's where, you know, any startup in this space or any, you know, software company in this space really has to keep an eye on how it's moving because um, best practices change every day and, you know, um, new frameworks come alive. But I think we've seen some stabilization. I do think that the machine learning landscape 
from like a fundamental framework and tooling perspective is is somewhat stabilized. Whereas, you know, two years ago, it was the Precambrian explosion, whereas like every day something new came up. So mm -hmm. I don't know your thoughts on that, if that's like something you're, you also would agree with, or if it's, uh, <laughs> we're still in the wild west. No, I, de I definitely agree with, with that statement. Um, I've written quite a bit about it. We've got an ebook, the definitive guide to machine learning platforms that try to map out the early phases of this Cambrian explosion. Uh, and then another one, Kubernetes for ML ops, uh, which, you know, for anyone who's still listening, who, you know, has alphabet soup in their head and wants to know what all these terms are and how they fit together, that will be a good one to check out. But I, I certainly agree that we're starting to see more, um, more, kind of coalescing of the the major components there are well-defined subcategories now within kind of this tooling and, and platform landscape uh, and it is continuing to be interesting uh, i'm curious from your perspective for you know folks that are coming at this from the data science machine learning side haven't done much with uh, ML ops or, or processes, you know, do the usual, you know, I've got a notebook on a server somewhere, write some code, you know, pull that code out of the notebook and, uh, you know, somehow get it into production. Like what, what's the first thing to do or, or the first three things to, to think about to be more as disciplined, the right word, uh, to advance your, your, your process. Yeah, I, I think that um, I would I would encourage the use of a tool. You know, obviously I'm biased. I think we, you know, we were uh, we our approach is to onboard people into all this these complicated tools that we're talking about. You know, the alphabet soup of Kubernetes and Argo and everything else. Um, the interface for gradient is actually quite simple. You know, the notebook is the starting point, um, and you know it it rewards closer inspection. So the deeper you go into it, the more you'll see where it adds value. Um, but and the, I should have said, what are the first three steps besides use gradient? Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, I think I, I the the they're really the ones that I think probably most people in the space would agree on. It's like um, find a a problem that you want to solve that's relatively narrowly scoped because uh, you know we've worked on. We, internally, we have a lot of machine learning projects and the ones that do really well are the ones that have a very clean sort of scope and we know what we're trying to solve. Um, I think when it becomes unbounded, like find something interesting in the data, it, it gets really hard because not only are you having tooling issues, you're trying to figure out what the, the question is. Um, and that's a, that's very attractive given that, you know, um, you can download TensorFlow and you kind of get superpowers. Like it's an, it's a, it is a fundamentally transformative thing that can do things that you, you know, can't do otherwise. But um, the fundamentals are still there, which are, you know, you you should commit to a process of, or, or sorry, define the problem that you want to solve. Any, any organization trying to onboard to machine learning broadly today, um, if they haven't already, would have to locate where they want to apply it. In our case, the first thing we ever did was um, just uh, uh, kind of like fraud detection and lead scoring. We get people to sign up every day. Um, you know, at this point, we've had, I think, over 350,000 people sign up. This is during the Bitcoin boom as well. So we want to make sure that, you know, who's a who's a real actor and who's not. And we had a very narrow sense of that. And that's that's a production um, thing that we use today. But when you when it's more unbounded, it becomes much harder. Um, I think, you know, developing the practice around it in software development, it is the collection of the, you know, GitHub readmes and the whether you do standups, you know, it's like there is a software development practice way beyond the tooling. Um, and you know, I think that's important. Uh, also, source control management is great. You know, uh, you don't you don't want to be you know naming your files. Um, you know, final 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 three dot ipynb uh, because it, it's just it, you know you're you're gonna put, get yourself in a in a you know complicated mess over time. So I think source control management is is key. But um, yeah, I don't know if that was two or three, but I you know I think yeah, the fundamentals yeah. are true regardless of. And again, this goes back to like I think this is a more well understood problem than maybe we all have uh, realized. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's coming at things from the data science perspective. What about coming at things from the engineering perspective? You know, say you've been working on on these kinds of problems uh, at a relatively modest scale. You know, what are the kinds of what are the gnarliest you know technical issues you run at trying to run this at um, you know provider scale? Yeah, that's a really good one. Um, 
OpenAI actually outlined a lot of them, which are when you start doing this a lot. So for example, we run uh, kind of a public gradient instance, which is where we run uh, all the free notebooks. Um, and so it's basically like one big managed instance. Uh, you know, there are some issues of scale for sure. Uh, you know, you're going to hit issues of pulling containers down, caching them at CD, which is the tool that kind of, you know, an essential tool for communication within the process. It does break down at a certain level. Um, you start have to, you know, look, you have to look for things like where, you know, your bottlenecks are. And so we've spent, you know, many years now optimizing this, um, you know, the, the way the pieces connect to one another, because it's very likely in your first stab at it, you will have an expensive GPU and an expensive CPU and a lot of memory, but you're actually using none of it due to something totally outside of, uh, you know, of, of that thing. Um, and figuring that out is hard. I think big teams, you know, it pays off to invest in that. I think Uber, you know, does great in that they have an expertise here and this is a, you know, an internal um, uh, effort, but I think a lot of companies would benefit from this tooling as well um, without having to go down that path of building custom, you know, or entirely purpose-built tooling. There will always be something that gets built internally. We have all sorts of, you know, admin tools that we build, but um, fundamentally we committed to a containerized process. We've adopted newer practices um, uh, and I think that pays off. And, you know, it allows us to ship ship a new version of the software every two weeks, you know, or whatever the, the release cadence is. Um, and that's the, that's the holy grail. It's like you want to be able, you know, machine intelligence broadly is like, can you build out a model that is predictive and powerful and also um, is in a system that can then be fine-tuned or, or modified as it reacts to the environment? So it's like we've built these predictive models that are incredible. Um, how do you, you know, now work that into to everything else. And I think that's the open question around uh, how software development, you know, and maybe there is something to learn there and, and some of it has to be redefined. You know, like we didn't talk a lot about hardware, but that's, that's a, you know, I, I think we might've had a conversation about that in the past, but mm -hmm. um, accelerator, you know, GPUs were, were video game cards and now they're, uh, you know, ML processing cards. And so there's yep. a whole host of, of new things coming out. And I think that's going to lead to a lot of interesting developments in the, the space that we're in, which is largely involved with like the interface between hardware and physical infrastructure and, you know, uh, sending uh, software into production and then the actual meat of the problem of like, I want to build a model and do something amazing. Anything you're particularly excited about and can talk about on that front? Um, yeah, I, I, I think broadly actually gets back to the, one of the things I kind of earlier in the conversation, I, I am particularly interested in uh, where the visualization pipeline and the compute pipeline collapse. Uh, we actually, I, I was at uh, SIGGRAPH, the big visual effects conference um, in LA, maybe three, three, three years ago or so. Uh, and it was clear that AI was sort of making its way in there. Everything from, you know, better rendering to bots in games. Um, and then on the other end, you have, you know, uh, driverless car simulators that can simulate environments. And I think the newest iteration of that is this, um, you know, a lot of talk around synthetic data. You know, if one of the limitations of building powerful machine learning models is generating data, how can that be done more quickly? Um, you know, can you use Unity? And I think the the blend of those gets really interesting. And I don't know exactly where it goes, but it is an area that I think is fascinating right now. Um, which is now you're roping in the, you know, the the content creators as well into this this tool, and it speaks to the power of it. You know, it it speaks to this this tool. You know. Machine learning in its current, you know, iteration is so powerful it can do things that are, you know, mind-boggling and complex. And you know, we need to regulate in, in probably lots of ways. But um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's making its way into, uh, you know, the universe way beyond sort of traditional ML stats and you know, data science. And so um, there will be a lot of dimensions that emerge. Software development is the one I'm thinking a lot about. But I think there, you know, yeah, it's an interesting time for sure. Yeah, over the years. Uh... Jensen's visualization demos at NVIDIA's uh, GPU conference have gotten extremely impressive, like all the ray tracing stuff and yeah. some of the simulation stuff that they're doing. And again, to your point, it's the same hardware. Yeah, I it, yeah. to me, that's where it gets really, really, really interesting. It looked like those were two totally divergent paths, and now it looks like... Um, you know, we had we at one point uh, it might still be live. We had a guy who was um, training a model to to drive his uh, Grand Theft Auto car on Twitch, and people could pay into his account, and it would you know pay for his paper space credit, so he could run the whole thing. 
Um, and this, this car was like, it, you know, it was not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get in the car, but it was a funny, you know, experience where it's like, we're going to train this thing using, you know, Grand Theft Auto. And it's like, those are interesting to me. Like, it's just like a totally emerging use case and, and, you know, something is possible that was never possible before. Um, That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so one last question for you. I'm curious if, you know, given that you, uh, you, you've got all these users doing machine learning stuff uh, on, on Gradient. Any unique insights into what's coming based on what folks are doing? Do you get that kind of visibility? Yeah, I mean, I think, candidly, I think a lot of people are still at the beginning of understanding this technology. And and I don't mean the the folks that, you know, we hang out with at NeurIPS. I mean, the, the you know, the <laughs> software engineers that are, you know, building building every other software tool we use. I think within that universe, machine learning is still exotic, new. Um, it, you know, it speaks to why, you know, Jeremy, uh, you know, can can get so much interest in fast AI, you know, he present, he presents fast AI as like the pragmatic way of getting started yeah. with machine learning. Deep uh, learning he's, coders. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that resonates a lot because it's still new. So from, you know, um, uh, at this point we've run something like 60 million hours of compute, you know, through the platform. And yeah. most of that is probably training, you know, or, you know, a lot of it is probably the first model that you train and trying to swap the data set out to see like what, what you can do. Um, I think it gets more interesting as that you're like, you know, wow, this actually worked in some way. Now, how do I blend it and, uh, you know, or, or do something with it? Um, in most cases, like, it's like, how do I take this model and turn it, you know, make it on an iPhone or, you know, deploy it? I think those are still really hard things. Um, so where's it going? I, I think that generally you will see more regular software engineers, whatever the, you know, whatever that uh, encompasses, you know, using these tools and understanding them more because it, it's sort of moving past academia. Um, Academia is still uh, mind blowing in, in how you know how fast it can move ahead. You know, every conference, it's like, wow, this is something that was totally unfathomable even a, you know a couple of years ago. But there's still a lot of catch up to do in the kind of um, machine learning as a professional practice. I would say. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Dylan, yeah. it's been amazing catching up with you. Um, yeah. Too bad we were, we uh, it's been a while since we've seen each other in person uh due to circumstances yeah your control but uh maybe one of these days we'll be able to grab a coffee or something at a conference can't wait thank you sam <laughs> thank you